All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Managing Beyond the Post-COVID New Normal uh, session that we have here today. Um, this has been a wonderfully set up conference, and I want to thank Frank and, and every, all the team who have, have brought it all together. And I'm really thrilled about this panel that we have here today. Um, we may appear just a few compared to some of the other panels you've had, but um, I believe we're pretty mighty as it would go. So we have an interesting topic here uh, really around managing beyond the post-COVID new normal. Um, each one of those words in the title could be loaded as to what does that really mean um, and what's happening relative to where we are. But uh, um, the COVID pandemic has introduced some workers to stay at home regulation. Other staff must work almost normally as their machines and systems cannot be moved to homes. How can companies utilize new technology, people and processes most effectively to stay ahead of the curve? What should leaders consider with regard to social and emotional aspects of working from home to effectively manage remote teams? Will these changes modify the concept of work today and in the future? Those are big, big questions. And, and with that, uh, um, it's interesting. Um, here today, uh, we've got Amandeep Midha, uh, the principal consultant for BEC Financial Technologies. He's based in Denmark. Um, BEC is a full service Danish IT firm with more than 50 years experience developing and operating in the, in the IT, IT in the financial sector. They point straightforward banking for Danish society. Amandeep has been a Harassas contributor previously in many ways, and his experience is great leverage uh, for all of us on today's topic. Saka Holland is chairperson of the Board of Trustees in the Zimbabwe Peace Building Initiative, clearly based in Zimbabwe. Um, Sakai has been involved in Zimbabwean politics and progress for many years, helping her people overcome extreme human problems. She has worked in the opposition and also worked as Zimbabwean co-minister of state for national healing, reconciliation, and integration. Currently, she's leading the Zimbabwe peacebuilding initiative to launch its new boy child project to partner with the already well-organized and widely recognized girl child project. She is no stranger to leadership through change, and we're really glad to have you here, Sakai. My name is Scott Mordell. I'm the chief executive officer and founder of the Forder Group, based in the United States. I've led various organizations for more than 35 years, and in January, concluded my tenure as YPO, longest tenured CEO in its 70-year history. YPO is formerly known as the Young Presidents Organization, is the global leadership community of chief executives, connected by the shared belief that the world needs better leaders. The organization includes more than 31,000 members across 240 countries. Altogether, members of the new is more than 9 billion US. We have a good view across industries and economies before and during the COVID disruptions. And like, I'm really glad to be able to share them here with you today. So with this, um, what we'd like to do is give each of the panelists a chance to make some opening perspectives relative to this topic at hand and just share a point of view with each of you. We don't expect everybody to take notes and, and all the rest. We're just hoping that uh, we can help you think slightly differently about the topic and also uh, hopefully um, yield you a couple of takeaways that you can use and apply in your leadership and thoughts about how you proceed forward as a leader and as a citizen of the world as we go around these topics. So with this, Amandeep, I'd love to kick off with you to just uh, share share some open perspectives, please. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the wonderful introduction. And uh, it's it's great to be in this panel across three people from three different continents and having connections with further different continents. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm Amandeep. I come from, of course, a tech background, as you introduced. And uh, my, my more core work is to upscale our technology staff, uh, 550 people across Denmark and Poland. That's our, where our teams are. And also hosting the monthly uh, developer meets, which used to be physical before. And otherwise, uh, carving the technical career paths uh, for all the, uh, all the uh, technical staff. Uh, what we have seen with uh, managing uh, staff in Corona time is that IT resources and uh, tool, um, uh, Microsoft Teams or uh, Skype or Zoom is one thing. But, but the emphasis is actually coming back on people. 
when we say digital transformation and like the three constituents were called the people, uh, technology and data, uh, we have always uh, seen that emphasis is also on technology, adoption, uh, data governance and oh yeah, people also. But now it's, it's the other way around. It's like everything is focused on people. Uh, let's say a circle around people. Like if if you have your workforce ready, if you if if you can drive your work uh, in this new dynamic, uh, it, everything depends on that. <clears throat> so people are recognized as as a kind of a crucial factor in achieving that digital transformation goal as well. Um, there are a lot of positives. Uh, I will let let me say this way. Like. Uh, um, there are extended working hours, uh, not that it's a good thing, but there's a more uh, available time uh, with the commutes and all uh, gone out. So we also kind of uh, interestingly discovered that uh, there's uh, the senior executives uh, in the company, uh, they have more time window availability. Suddenly they are responding to mails faster, they're like they're checking their messages uh, more frequently. So, you know, like, okay. Uh, so that means like some senior leaders are more approachable and available. So what best we can do to utilize that situation? Uh, s same thing with uh, some subject matter experts. Like there are some initiatives always in the company which uh, wait for a certain subject matter expert to be available, to be driven. And now this subject matter expert is... Uh, available little more uh, than a normal uh, in his our calendar and uh, let's drive an initiative so let's let's kind of do an ama session ask me anything session or a kind of a community session like hey it's an open house come come and ask your questions uh, so kind of driving those um, in initiatives as well um, <clears throat> so that is something like with, with the top top level management and like subject matter experts. Uh, then there is something around like, um, we never explored a hackathon before as a team building activity. Mm. So can we do a hackathon? It will be a team building activity. It will be kind of a bonding uh, element between uh, uh, different uh, people working across Denmark and including Poland. So earlier, all those questions of uh, Danish employees, Polish employees, now everybody is scattered. You, you don't have those questions. Like you have to answer the question at a whole different level. Um, so th these are these are the, some kind of a positive changes or kind of like trying to do uh, things differently. Um, if, if I have a more another one minute, I would like to add uh, is the 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 most crucial element after that comes is uh, communication mm -hmm. um so when when you have staff in your in your office uh, they, basically there's no coffee machine chatter now there's no lunch chatter now you you don't get to hear what's going on from our different colleagues from different departments so and and to prevent any assumptions from creeping in it's important that the leaders uh, communicate leaders managers communicate in a more comprehensive way um, the importance of uh, communicating the why, why this work needs to be done is now much more important than we considered before. Like, oh, you just give a direction. What needs to be done? If that is communicated, that's it. Like, now uh, there's a more emphasis coming on on the why part. And uh, yes, uh, we know that like uh, everybody at their home, um, People have turned into caregivers, caretakers, care receivers. You know, like the word mm -hmm. care is still there. And how can employers skip uh, uh, that paradigm of being a caregiver uh, to its employees? Right. Uh, and furthermore, to prevent any communication silos, which uh, which might creep in, uh, especially. Uh, the, the, the focus has been on more open-natured sessions. Uh, instead of kind of uh, defining the tasks and steps to solve something, a more of an engaging conversation now, um, like why it needs to be done, what's the importance, and let's build a solution to it. It's a more of a collaborative way. Um, community level engagements, uh, of course, uh, there are online tools for that, but uh, kind of uh, what about like across team collaborations? Some teams... Um, in, in the same office they used to communicate that was okay but now they have to collaborate and they have to be aware that the other team exists you know the uh, the, the the interesting thing uh, like uh, is uh, what we call like uh, 
no communication is also communication we used to say because when somebody is sitting in a meeting and quiet you know, uh, the body language and everything is still a communication and now mm-hmm. if if there is no communication means you don't exist there's there's no re- there's no realm of your existence literally uh, especially if you attend a meeting with a camera off and like uh, so th- so but uh, it adopting point is one thing a second is the manager's job the leader's job is going to become more kind of comp- it won't become easy anytime soon because the shift to hybrid which is kind of coming like you could be online you could be physical uh the managers also kind of uh, they cannot like uh, demand a greater disclosure uh like okay can you work at this time or okay yes you have a child to take care of or can you tell me why why you cannot like you cannot demand a greater disclosure but at the same time as a manager you have to build a greater level of a trust environment and the trust environment requires uh, which which the point the final thing which i'm coming to is um now every leaders and managers career path or kind of their skill uh, what you say skill ladder one skill which has definitely got added is how much of uh, kind of a trust environment they have created uh, in their team because then you get the work done and uh, then there's a effective team participation there's a collaboration so uh, we used to call about like uh, the affiliative uh, coaching style leadership uh, but this is the new dimension now added that the manager uh, provides a psychological safety net uh, and the trust environment in which kind of uh, your employees can engage uh, they feel creative they feel responsible in kind of uh, being part of the change uh, and and we are still <laughs> discovering we are still in that process we are still coming back to the hybrid and uh, figuring out uh, what new expectations from managers and um, employees should be or what new skills we expect now yeah <laughs> i would i would call it my talk for now thank you amandi covered a, a whole number of 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 both tactics as well as um, you know just yeah. perspectives about where where leaders and we can focus and emphasize i appreciate that and um um looking at this panel we we do represent different industries different uh countries and even different phases of covid okay so so with that it's uh, um it's really interesting diversity and so we'll uh, we'll turn it over to sakai for for some some opening uh, perspectives if you'd like to share please yes um i think that uh, it's very good to have amand here with me because i'm a user of the technologies but at my age as an elder in my society it is to really understand how to connect this new world to the one where our people have been deposited and left in terms of what uh, is available to them to be with the rest of the world so my job in peace building is to really understand the issues that come from our people from the west from our well I'm more familiar with Australasia than with the north I've really never lived um I have no interest or curiosity about the north although I did do my masters in Wisconsin and uh, I've been to the EU to do meetings in the UK but briefly so the point I'm making here is um in australasia is where the majority of humanity lives and um there for me has been shaped how we look at ourselves in africa so this whole discussion on climate change my husband is like amand he is an it buff um when he first came to zimbabwe in 1980 He wanted to see where I came from and I had no interest in going to rural Zimbabwe because I knew that with two little children we might find difficulty. So he went off he went with my relatives male ones they got because they went everywhere. When he came back after two weeks I've never seen him so tired so excited and he just said to my father dad we'd been married for 13 years 
I want as an engineer to bring water and sanitation connectivity to rural Zimbabwe. We all laughed, of course, because we didn't understand what he was talking about. Um, so he described what we had done all our lives, the difficulty of getting water from the big pumps when they could have just bush pumps to get that. And he wanted to know what people had used for sanitation before colonialism. Anyway, uh, my father called the Minister for Water, said my son-in-law is here. Happily, uh, one of my uncles was the minister, so he was given an office. We were all very skeptical about what he was going to do, but really, he asked for an office, for a team of engineers, and within 18 months, they discovered how a bush pump and that sanitation could be done with something called the Blair toilet from the Blair laboratory here in Harare, which was a tool that was used for sanitation by um, engineers who had come from the UK, from the, uh, your Navy there. They'd invented this and it was sitting in the lab in Harare. So they took that, built a trough. I mean, engineers think differently to us people in social sciences. And it's a real joy for me to have spent like 55 years with Jim and uh, just seeing how different we are. And he has just given an introduction as Jim would give, as he was giving me an hour ago. So anyway, what happens here is that they set up functional water and sanitation systems over 10 years, EU funded, and it really transforms rural Zimbabwe. He trains committees to look after the uh, Blair toilet and uh, up after the water. And it really is working very well. Anyway, um, he then moves to use his um, pension to get into what he told us was the new field of IT in 1989. We were just really shocked that there was this new thing he was telling us about email, about how the technologies work, and he installed it in our house, and then connected with a group at university where they really got Zimbabwe to have the first email service before many countries, and um, which today still functions very well. It's called Mango, Micro Network for you know, Non-Governmental Organizations. It's still the least um, costly, uh, because there's training there. And um, when the white farmers lost their land, our house became like a, a coffee shop where they, my husband and a group of friends cannibalized all computers, rebuilt them for the farmers to connect with their children who'd gone overseas, right? So when the COVID pandemic hit, um, for us, my husband had been working at home from 2005, 2004. So this topic that um, some workers had to stay at home, that's where my husband has always worked uh, since 2004. And that was the practice in Zimbabwe with sections of business, of the faith-based organizations, of business, of uh, uh, institutions and of government departments. Already there was a developing culture when the pandemic hit of people working at home. However, the pandemic coming intensified everything because when you talk about technologies and what you just described, it's the world of a small population which needs to wake up to what it says about what's happening, but needs to reconnect with the base where the majority of citizens of the world are based without connectivity. So what's happened in Zimbabwe basically is that we have waited since late to 2019 for the first wave to hit us, it didn't. The second wave to hit us, it hasn't. The third wave is apparently here, we haven't seen it. Because the numbers of people that are affected by COVID, 
19, and we've always put a stroke and mutations, the numbers here remain small. And it's not our government rigging numbers because we as civil society, and Zimbabwe civil society, it's very sophisticated, long history, and it's really, I mean, internationalized. When you now use the tools we are using, your family, your church network, your workplace network, your civil society network, all those and put them together. The numbers within your own perimeter of the ones affected and the dying don't come up. So what uh, the topic for me did was force me to interrogate my husband on exactly what would be useful to say in a platform like this. And basically, we agree with each other that from the beginning, the Zimbabwe government really adapted its behavior to the requirements of the World Health, World, World Health Organization recommendations. And I really believe that, again, um, we were pushed into a situation where the majority of citizens would depend on informal trading, as it is called in Western countries. For us, it's very formal because it's where we access the daily requirements. It's very formal. Um, they, the, and this is mainly women with their boy child and their girl child. Is the husband, is it the formal sector? Abroad in the diaspora, we have the largest diaspora, I'm told, in the world. Um, so the women and their boy child and girl child found themselves without the means of livelihoods because we've got a very weak safety net in our country, a very weak health system, uh, very weak of everything. The professional classes earn such little money here. The lecturers, the people in IT, that they themselves have no access at home for the kinds of technologies required so that they work at home. They need, they needed and still need to go to the university, to the colleges to have connectivity. So when you talk about um, this topic in Zimbabwe, um, we are a country of the biggest contradictions in the world. What's happened is that government put all the World Health Organization uh, requirements in place, made a lot of people suffer, but we were pushed, all of us, back onto the back foot and to look at how we were not getting the numbers of dead, the numbers of people. And what we discovered was that our diets, um, the traditional diet, is based on what Western people would call weeds in our backyards, weeds in our field. We've always eaten those. And uh, um, what we found was in relying on those, we actually got stronger. We also realized that the children, because they were now eating these, they had no access to Nando's um, pizza, they had no access to junk food we discovered that they really became healthier. And uh, that they really got used to this traditional food. And in my household, I don't think they remember what a junk food looks like anymore because the costs are too um, high and um, many people are out of the economy which allows them to have those luxuries which are self-destructive. So basically, I shouldn't run around the topic. Zimbabwe has got very structured and ordered sectors which come from the traditional society as well as from the very um, brutal British system uh, which was used by Cecil John Rhodes to defeat the local structures and put in place the British ones, turning us into Anglophones. And uh, unfortunately, uh, most people are caught 
in the framework of the past. We were raised in families where the people were second generation with 1890. And they actually knew that a new power had come and they had to hang on to their tradition and move with the new one and defeat the Westerners inside their Western practices by going to school, Western schools, and understanding how that worked. And that my generation clung to that and keep telling people that it's Western scholars that teach us that all humanity came from Africa. So with me, when people are being racist, I always quietly then remind them, excuse me, you're talking to mother. All African women are your mothers. And when you're here in Africa, you're home. They jump and I give them their Western scholars' findings. And they say, is this true? I say, true. So by doing that, you also remind people that these are not things that are just in the air. These discoveries of technologies, my belief and conviction is that they are rediscoveries at a very low level of what civilizations in the past, in Africa, in India, in Asia, in Latin America, have experienced. And that in peace building, my job is to say to all humanity, excuse me, what do you do when you get up in the morning? They say, oh, we greet people. Greeting is a peace building tool, which people learned from Africa. Good morning, good afternoon, good day, good night, welcome. Every civilization has that. I have never in all my generational life met anybody who said to me, bad morning or go back home. Never. It's always very good protocol. And I think it's peace building by humanity to survive within the family, within the community, and in the broader world. Right. What am I saying here? Yeah. Zimbabwe has put in place the most brilliant structures, like the regulatory body, POTRAS. It's the Post Telecommunications uh, POTRAS. Uh, my husband just told me what it means. But it's got one of the most brilliant technocrats, like you are. He's just in that world. But he has other, other educational fortes which just make him so unique. So what is his function, the Portra's one? It's so, really to ensure, uh, go, go to ahead, ensure connectivity of everybody. And in Zimbabwe, because of these sanctions, which are real, but which, again, when you look at the history, we were responsible for bringing those onto the world through the Harare Declaration for Human Rights and Democracy in 1990 here. We brought those on ourselves. So, um, but they're nonsensical today because they have got Zimbabwe in a very unsafe place. But Portras has got the most sophisticated, world-class uh, portfolio of what it does. And they are actually out there in the rural areas ensuring connectivity. But because of the economic malaise we've been thrown into, by the Western countries. And obviously for people like me, it's because I think Western countries really want to ensure we are weak in Zimbabwe and they can come and really do all the exploitation they want. Otherwise, I don't understand why they are doing it. But uh, Potras is also connected to what the African Union, a very, very slowly but surely body that is becoming sophisticated. They've got something called Smart Africa. And Smart Africa is a very simple task, which is to actually accelerate sustainable socio-economic development on the continent, ushering Africa into a knowledge economy through affordable access to broadband and usage of information and communications technologies. They are doing fantastic work to really 
get Africans connected to the modern. But what worries me is that the issue of climate change for me is very real because it has happened in the past and destroyed all these brilliant civilizations. And what really amazes me is the blindness of my great-grandchildren here in that climate change is real and it could hit us anytime. And so us back I'd like to bring us back to COVID, if, if I might, uh, given, our, okay. given our topic. Uh, um, so um, uh, okay. just in, in wrapping up, uh, would you like to wrap up uh, just... Uh, yes, let me wrap up and um, say we're running COVID-19 we... has strengthened our resolve to go back into our roots, bring out the best without losing the best of what we have got from other civilizations. But also COVID-19, because it has not hit us, we are in suspense that it's coming. Thank you. Really, really, really emphatic points there. Um, I'd just like to share just a, a, a framing. Um, there's been so many conferences talking about COVID and, and um, just post-COVID and all of the rest of that. It's, it's very easy, um, at least for me, uh, to get lost in some of the some of the main main points and thrusts as, as time would go. So so f- from from my standpoint, um, uh, just simply, you know, we've had just an, an we're having a period of incredible accelerated change, uh, not just in the technology, but in the ways that people work and the habits of which we have, um, and in the um, it's affecting consumerism, it's affecting societies, and it's affecting business. And it's just, uh, you know, some people say it's been eight years of, of change in a year. Some people say 10. Some people say three. I don't know. I think it depends on which business you're in or where, where, where you are geographically uh, to, to suggest that. But um, we're, we're seeing, obviously, a time of shortages. You know, the global supply chain has been incredibly disrupted and, and uh, different, uh, different shortages of uh, different uh, products pop up at different times. Part of that's covid Part of that is geopolitical realignments, and, and part of that is, uh, is, is efforts and resources have gone to COVID. They've gone away from other things. And so that's been a, a, big, a big aspect of, of things. And, of course, we've got this, um, um, certainly in the United States, uh, where, where, where I'm primarily from, but uh, certainly as we look across the world with the uh, um, United Nations SDGs, um, Sustainable mm-hmm. Development Goals, and everything else, this gender and racial reckoning that's happening uh, around the world is, um, has been accelerated uh, for sure with COVID, uh, but also um, it's going to continue. And, and that, that adds into the mix that's not necessarily directly COVID uh, related. And uh, all of this, all of this can happen again. Um, you know, um, I'm vaccinated. I'm fortunate for that. Other people have different challenges as, as in getting vaccinations and going through waves of, of COVID and the rest and variants uh, and everything can just change, change all this in, in a minute. So, so it's not a linear journey is my point that there's a, that there's an awareness that uh, change is going to be constant. It's going to continue to be constant. And, and uh, all of us need to figure out um, how, how best our organizations and we um, can live uh, and, and do business uh, with, within all of that as, as, as it plays out. So um, uh, the work from home piece of all this is, is certain to stay, okay? And, and it's, uh, um, it's certain, whatever that looks like, it may not be as extreme, but uh, we're forever going to be uh, uh, addressing in, in the office, in person together, and um, in, in virtual situations and all. It's, it's quite amazing. So it brings to the point that the fact that um, I think the number is approximately 102 billion people have lived on this planet before us. OK, and there's about seven billion people on the planet now. And, and uh, they've in our histories, uh, um, we've been we've been social. We've evolved to be incredibly social. We've been, we've evolved to process uh, inputs uh, in person in, in ways that uh, the virtual environment doesn't allow us to process. And so the change, technology change and this life change is just happening faster than our evolution. And that creates a lot of challenge uh, for us as individuals and certainly for us and our organizations as, as, we, as we learn to, to, to work with that. So I, I, I fall very much uh, with where uh, Amandeep and, and Sakai had touched upon uh, that uh, you know, this is ultimately all about the people, okay? And it's, all, it's all about how we interact as people, uh, as humans, uh, and, and um, we, how, we, how we adjust to, to the changes. Um, 
I'm recognizing from my point of view is that business is, is the force of good in the world. Okay. Um, it, business ultimately pays for everything somehow or another business and commerce pays for governments. It pays for healthcare. It pays for uh, um, just uh, innovations. It pays for new, new technologies. And um, here we are talking to business leaders and NGO leaders in this community. And it's important to know that uh, the quality of our leadership is, is really um effectively the quality of the world that we're going to see is in, in, in the time ahead. So so we've got a part to play as, as we see that. And I'm excited, actually, because nobody has the playbook. There's no right way to do this kind of change that's happened before. We have 102 billion people before us of whom we can learn from. But at the same time, nobody's got the playbook. Every industry, every country is, is, is somehow affected by all of this. And, and the idea that uh, we can innovate within here, we can change, we can disrupt, and also we can create safer spaces for uh, for quality of life to, 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 to be improved uh, as, as time goes. But it's hard to see that when so many are suffering still and and, uh, and the rest. So I think we just need to find our balance. So, so with that, um, uh, I, th- I think this post-COVID environment, we start to think about working from home and, and the rest of that stuff. Uh, um, I, I want to turn it over to you, Amandeep. You, you made a, a very interesting comment uh, that in a virtual world, proactive communication is important. Uh, otherwise, yep. we don't exist. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit. I couldn't write as fast as uh, you were speaking. And, and uh, given our human nature that if somebody's sitting in the conference room and they happen to be an introvert, maybe they're not talking, they're there, okay? Uh, but but um, in your experience, um, what advice would you have for people to, to, to make sure that they exist, uh, okay, whether they be the leader or they be the participant uh, uh, in, in, a, in a virtual session? Yeah, well, uh, everyone has an in, a certain interest to be part of that team or certain uh, interest to be employed in that team, let's say it this way. Uh, then it's all about um, what actually interests you. Uh, do you have some interesting uh, knowledge nuggets to share with the rest of us? Uh, or uh, do, is there something you're struggling with? So it, it's basically like open opening that uh, dialogue and also seeing like who are those people who are not communicating enough mm-hmm. or staying silent and yes, proactively reaching them. That's why I said like uh, another skill and dimension needed for the leaders of this age is like creating that trust environment, creating the psychological safety net that everybody speaks up. If, if everybody has their kind of contributions and then um, any initiatives like like as i said like a hackathon as a team building like like these are the technical guys like guys and girls so they they do the job as uh, as they are expected but can we make it more fun so maybe that brings more engagement um, also something around like we did uh, some uh, something around social learning so if if a team is moving from one technology to another, especially when you're scattered all across individuals at home, like communication can go messy. So it's like, okay, let's step onto this uh, new piece of technology together and uh, let's bring some, some kind of uh, peer-to-peer learning. Uh, let's b- make a reading circle. Like it's, it's like a 30 minutes a week, mm-hmm. but you know, like everybody comes prepared Everybody has to read uh, something uh, and he or she can then contribute. Hey, this is what I read. This I found interesting and this I did not, do not find interesting. So, you know, like the communication has still happened. I find this interesting or I find uh, I did not find this interesting. You have to kind of commit to that communication instead of just saying something is happening. I don't know I'm part of it or not. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that kind of a proactive uh, proactivity I was uh, referring to in kind of reaching out uh, and... Uh, uh, having your team, each individual, uh, aware why we are doing what we are doing. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. And, and Sakai, you had uh, touched on this idea that uh, um, uh, people seem stuck in the past. Okay, and and and, and I and, and they they. they w- in, in my leadership journey, there's always been uh, inertia is uh, is the preferred choice in many cases of, of many people, right? So so it's 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 like how do we move people? In your view, what's the way to move people from the past toward a future? Uh, um, and uh, um, and how would you, you touched on it a bit? But I'd love to have you just kind of answer um, uh, maybe as as, as um, 
direct to the in question. Zimbabwe, the way that it's being done with the technologies, uh, the mobile money, for example, which provides mobile money services to citizens who really are disconnected to the other technologies right. that you're talking about. And then things like drones, which are being used in Africa to actually monitor the movement of animals, the movement of uh, uh, poachers, smugglers, and uh, which are really very, very useful to um, keeping order. Now, um, you say, how do we um, actually then um, get people to change from the past? I look at the United States of America, for example, and um, the U United Kingdom. I don't want to derail myself from what I'm trying to say, but I want you to understand these are examples where we demonstrate best my point about the common humanity. The way in which the African-Americans built the wealth of the country, um, the world, and they really got this specific Western type economy, but are denied access to enjoying as a people the benefits of that. Um, to me, if only those so-called have been um, white supremacists, because I don't want to blanket everybody under that, understood that they really are part of the same humanity as everybody. Peace building and really talking to people peacefully, I believe connects with the humanity of everybody. And um, our logo is we are one. We are taught about this in church, in every religion. Christians say we are created in the image of God. Then you look at the gene uh, structures. How do you get that information to the grassroots of every society to see our common ground and then to build society together so that everybody benefits? Nobody loses anything by everybody benefiting. I want to differ with you though where you say that business runs everything, because I'm thinking of Western business. In Africa, it more or less takes away than gives back. And one challenge I have is how, through Horasis, do we connect to even why we have done the Boy Child Project? Again, it's another anomaly in the minds of our Western fellows in our society. A very brilliant girl child program, a girl child international UN day of the girl child because girls and women are oppressed. How do you achieve that without a UN international day for the boy child so that the two are partnered and produce a new world where they are working together? It, to me, it's just a no brainer. Whoever brought the girl child project the women in Beijing, which I was very much part of, put those arguments I'm putting today at that time and they were never understood. I think that what we need to do, especially myself in Africa, is to really appeal to all other humanity to understand their origins and to connect so we find a way to get that forward. Okay. Just because we're going to get cut off here in just a moment, I want to make sure uh, um, uh, everybody gets a, a chance to make a quick close. Thank you very much. Uh, as, as it goes, your um, passion is uh, is very powerful. Uh, um, so just a um, uh, closing comment or observation you'd like to share, Amandeep, just uh, that uh, uh, I, take a I guess uh, I guess we're in the different times and the uh, different times of uh, leadership skills and different times of uh, connecting with people. Uh, looking back at your roots, as Sokai very well said, uh, there, there has been a time of reflection individually and for the co corporates, for the businesses, and building a new world together. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Very, very well said. And uh, just uh, very briefly, uh, as it goes, um, uh, um, Sakai, Shakai, uh, closing, um, closing comment real quick. No, I'm very pleased. 
to be with two yeah. boys children from different parts of the world yeah, well, <laughs> and enjoy well, my grandmotherhood. <laughs> yeah. well, really, well, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. We appreciate you uh, joining us and the two of you. Just so much to share. I know we could use much more time and, and, and drive deeper. I just want to share that uh, my, my takeaway, my suggestion for all of us is uh, to con- continue to find some inspiration in our lives. They can be small. They can be so- from somebody doing something amazing. But I get inspired when I see somebody who seems a little bit like me or maybe just as flawed as I am uh, do great things. And uh, from that, that inspires me to find my best self. So let's keep working it. And uh, good luck and uh, good evening as it goes. Bye for now. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Scott. Thanks. Bye.